what I'd like to do now is call on Rob Liddell to come forward. Rob has a background in uh, aviation medicine, which is extended over many years. He's been employed overseas and in Australia in top positions. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, planning a long distance flight. This bears reference to our main speaker today, uh, who will be talking about his solo flight to England. So Rob will be telling us about the sorts of things that Barry should have taken into account before he started. Maybe Barry ticked all the boxes, maybe he didn't. Rob, would you like to come forward, please? Dr. Rob Liddell. I'm not sure if we were at cross purposes earlier, but uh, I'm not talking about long distance flying and I'm not talking about the operational aspects of flying. What I'm going to talk about is just some medical considerations um, that you need to go through or you can will help you if you go through before you were to conduct a ferry flight, the sort of thing that Barry did. So ferry flights are done in all sorts of aeroplanes and uh, um, Barry's going to show you uh, an aircraft that he did it in which is uh, an amazing feat. And uh, around about the uh, same vintage, perhaps a little bit after, is things like this uh, Warsak's Ark which was uh, flown uh, all around Africa by a uh, uh, by one of the film producers there. And uh, that photo was actually taken at Oshkosh, and that thing still flies there, which is quite an amazing uh, bit of kit. Well, talking about medical problems, if you were, wanted to approach um, your flight, and you think, oh, what's the most likely thing that's going to happen to me if I've got to think about medical things? Well, <clears throat> in fact, if you look at the statistics, if it doesn't matter where you look, the most common, common cause of in-flight incapacitation and air crew falling, um, failing to present for a flight is the old Delhi Valley. Uh, a good dose of the squitters or uh, vomiting and diarrhea. Hopefully you get your symptoms before you get in the aircraft because then you can delay getting in the aircraft and even delay the flight. But many pilots will attest to the fact that uh, it's several hours before uh, the symptoms come on and they're well into the flight by the time that happens. And there's all sorts of apocryphal stories of uh, the instrument panels being covered with uh, <laughs> the uh, leftovers of some curry eaten in some dodgy spot. And the interesting thing that always fascinated me is as a professional air crew, <coughs> flying as a group, you always have different, different meals. So that the theory being that nobody gets the one with a bait in it, so only one person falls over. Because that, fall, that concept falls over totally when you lob into Dubai or somewhere like that and you all go to the same greasy spoon and eat the same food and uh, then get in an aircraft and fly away because uh, the chance of getting a gastro from a restaurant far outweighs that of getting it from in-flight catering. Anyway, that's the common, commonest cause. And the culprit can be a bacteria, it can be virus, or it can be toxins released by bacteria usually only comes from three sources. That's the water you drink, the food you eat, or dirty hands handling the food or touching your mouth. And if you take care of those three things, you can pretty well give yourself almost a 90% chance of staying sound. However, it's not as easy as um, some people might think. When you're doing a ferry flight, things aren't as well organised. You can often be in a, a, a place that's a developing country and uh, the local drinking water is mostly or frequently not up to the standards that your guts might be used to. Uh, the locals will have no problem with it. They've been drinking it since the day they were born. Um, but for those of us who roll through these towns, the local water can be very, very toxic on our intestines with uh, very predictable results. Things like ice. People think, oh, well, I won't have the local water, but I'll have a Coke out of a Coke can. Oh, would you like ice, sir? Oh, yes, I'll have some ice, please. It's pretty hot today. Because the local ice is made from local water, and that's how you get your bacteria, or viruses, or toxins imported into your drink um, that way. So when you're doing these sort of trips, don't drink the local water. You don't have ice made from local water unless you know that the water's been sterilised, and there's no way you can know that. 
Um, so the answer is just no ice. Have a drink, it's a little warmer. And drinking bottled water, I have seen in Lagos a little factory filling Perrier bottles out of the tap and putting a most amazing looking cap on it that looks as though it's been sealed in France. And these go out into the street and pass it by, by the Perrier water, looks, looks good. Um, and it's just come from a tap around the back. So you can't even be sure that your bottled water is sound unless you buy it from a reputable outlet who, who won't be buying it from local vendors. A lot of people say, oh yeah, I just pick up something at the airport. Airports are terrible places to buy food by and large because they, their hold over time is so long. They don't have people buying high, high quantities of food. So they hold the food for ages, so the bugs lob in there and they all develop themselves nicely in a big colony. So instead of just getting 10 to the minus, or 10 to the 10 bacteria when you have your mouthful of this particular thing, you get gazillions of them. And although your gut might be able to handle a small dose, when you get a big dose, it'll flatten you. So try and eat at places where they have high turnover of food and uh, sort of the, the class of place where they can't afford to have people going away and saying, I got gastro from that place, I'm not going back. <coughs> Make sure that what you eat's just been cooked and is steaming hot, because that way you can at least guarantee that those bugs and viruses that are susceptible to heat sterilisation have been killed, and that gets rid of a good percentage of them for you. Don't eat salads. The vegetables that you get from salads are often grown in uh, human uh, sewerage uh, fertilised fields and they're not well, uh, often just washed in tap water. Uh, tap water is a worry for a start, so you can really uh, top yourself up nicely with a salad. <laughs> if you're going to take rations with you in your aeroplane, don't buy a sandwich at the airport outlet and eat it halfway into your six hour flight because again, running a risk. Be prepared, buy some canned produce or something that's sealed and, and produced under good conditions, something that a reputable uh, company has produced, and that way you can at least make sure that you can remain in good condition for the uh, length of your flight. Be wary of fresh fruit. Now I always used to think, well, what can you do to an orange? I mean, it's sealed and it's got a nice skin around it, but apparently what they do is they inject mills of water into anything that's injectable uh, in some places just to increase the weight of that product. So just the few cents they make by selling you something that's a little bit heavier um, is important to them. So they'll go get up to all these tricks. So you think you're buying a nice orange, how can this be anything but sterile? And it's got 20 cc's of tap water injected neatly in the middle which you're going to swallow. And hand hygiene is important. <clears throat> I think you've probably all been caught up with this uh, swine flu thing running around, they're actually saying, wash your hands, wash your hands, because viruses can be transmitted by, by hands and so can bacteria. Um, and uh, people who lick pens, you know, stick it in their mouth while they're drawing and then falls on the floor and they pick it up. I mean, all those sort of things are ways of getting the bacteria into your mouth. It probably doesn't matter in this society because you're used to our bugs and uh, it's not going to be a problem for you. But if you're the only pilot in a little aircraft flying from London to Athens or something, and uh, you, you need to look after yourself. You can't afford to get sick. Baby wipes are a good idea because uh, they, they come, they're sterile, you can wipe your hands on them and throw them away. Just want to, uh, for all the aviation related people here, just so you can wake up for a minute because you're sick of medicine. Um, you're all familiar with hand starting aircraft, I'm sure, and Barry might need to talk about this later on. But some people have noticed never learn unless you remind them time and time again. Now for the last time, what pray tell is wrong with the picture I'm going to show you? Um, if you all paid attention in class, you would notice immediately the safety violation I'm referring to. Now, what's not right here? <laughs> She's on the wrong side of the problem. Okay, that's correct, but wheels aren't chops. Now how stupid is that? <laughs> Anyway, fatigue is another important uh, consideration in ferry flying. Now in a tiger moth, circadian dysrhythmia, which is the name we give to when you travel faster than the sun or slower than the sun and you get out of sync with your body clock, 
Not like you'd be try a problem in a tiger, uh, tiger moth or an aeroplane getting along at 80 knots. But um, there are other things which will make you fatigued. Things like poor sleep due to strange hotels with stranger beds, long days flying in cramped conditions, the stress of unfamiliar airspace um, and terrain, language difficulties. Anyone who's flown and tried to talk to us, a Greek controller will understand what I'm saying there. <laughs> stress of weather-related problems, and of course, the bureaucratic delays um, prior to departure and on arrival. You can imagine coming up to an airport like this, sitting there, never been in there before. Um, a certain amount of adrenaline gets running when you're doing this stuff. And uh, you really don't want to get it wrong. And that's a fatigue. That, that's lovely, but it's also fatiguing. And you're not likely to want to get up and do circuits. And you can imagine the delays at this immigration zone. So there's all these things that we, we don't really count. We just think, oh, it'll be all right. It'll be all right on the day. But you can lose two hours here trying to find a phone to ring immigration to get someone to come to the airport to check you in. So how can you minimise fatigue? Have a good support crew, that, that's really essential. Have planning and clearances done for you so that you're not spending half the night on the computer or the telephone trying to get clearances. And if you have your handling organised by a company that does it for a living, who again can't afford to make mistakes, it'll work well for you. Do your pre-flight planning in great detail well before the trip. And plan for realistic sector lengths. That's the one thing a lot of people do wrong. They say, I can fly seven hours a day or six hours a day. All they're thinking about is sitting in the aeroplane doing that. They've forgotten all the stuff around both sides of that takeoff and the landing, getting through the airport, not paying enough um, dash to the uh, guy that's going to give them their customs tick and all that sort of thing. It just goes on and on. And one of the ways to ameliorate the fatigue thing is to have frequent rest days. Being dehydrated, physiological things can make you fatigued. So you always should take plenty of fluids and low glycemic index foods for in-flight rations. Nothing will fatigue like a full bladder, and I think we all know about that. And I've already known some people slipping off just to keep themselves awake. <laughs> so always have the necessary toilet, toileting gear on board. Don't say, oh, I'll be right. You're never going to be right. You're always going to need a pee, and sometimes you even can't stop there. <laughs> On night, so always consider it, plan for it, and if you've done that, you probably won't need it. On night slop stops, if you're not a good sleeper, use a simple hypnotic. Use something to make sure you get sleep. You need sleep. When the British uh, forces attacked the Falklands, they flew harriers from England to the Falkland Islands. They had a sector there, they had two long days where they had to do mid-air refuelling. So single pilot operation, um, four hours or three hours out of, out of England, air-to-air -air refuel, on I think to Ascension Island, overnight there, next day, similar deal. So two very long days, they had to get sleep. And all of those guys were mandatorily given 20 milligrams of temazepam to make sure they got some sleep. So used effectively, hypnotics can be very helpful. If you need your teddy bear, take it. Um, sometimes it's just the pillow, and sometimes it's handy to have it in the aeroplane to keep it comfortable. Keep alcohol in intake to a minimum, and try and be physically fit and get some exercise during the trip. Then what? What happens if you do get sick on the trip? Well, the most common thing people get is probably headaches. And they're due to often to just stress, or a bit of relative hypoxia because you've been sitting at 12,000 feet without oxygen and all your, um, or, or your PO2 in your brain got a little, bit, a little bit low and your blood vessels up there dilated, gave you a nice old headache. Neck muscle fatigue from sitting there holding your, holding your headset on. Colds and flu can come anywhere. And when you're stressed and fatigued, you can get it more easily. Otitic barotrauma, which is the problem people get with their ears when they when they go up and down in a change of pressure, um, they, that can hit anyone. And so just having simple things like nasal decongestants will help that. Renal stones can be totally incapacitating. You probably might have all seen someone throw themselves on the floor, start vomiting, and just roll around in incredible pain. These people can't fly aeroplanes. 
And if you're prone to renal stones, or even if you aren't, if you get dehydrated, you increase the risk of making one. And if you make one and you feel that stone coming down the ureter to your bladder, you won't be able to fly an aeroplane very well at all. So keep your fluids up, make sure the kidneys are flushing well. Always consider um, insect-borne diseases such as malaria. Insect bites are a constant threat in all sorts of places. And of course, there's always the old cup that you get when you bark yourself while you're pre-flighting the aeroplane, walk into the aileron, etc., and sprains, and they all go with doing this sort of activity. So see your favourite doctor, explain your flight, what you're going to do, and get a small stock of medication to take along just in case. You've got it with, with you, you might not need it. If you haven't got it, you're bound to want it. So you just need a few dressings for cuts and grazes, crepe type bandage for joints, sprains and big cuts, some non-stick gauze, a bit of antiseptic, a bit of burn cream and antibiotic cream. And then medicine wise, your doc can give you a prescription to get some broad spectrum antibiotics, which will cover most things from a sore toe to a chest infection and uh, one of them is even used for malaria prophylaxis, so it's um, quite good multifunction. Insect repellent, some medication for gastro, because that does work and will make life more, easily, uh, more, more pleasant for you. Some anti-inflammatory drugs for sprains, muscular pains, etc. And some moderately strong analgesics in case you get the big pain from whatever. Sun protection cream, don't forget that, and cream for treating rashes and chafe. Because just remember that the local medical facilities may not be what you're used to, and you might not want to end up in there. <laughs> and that was uh, a scrub, scrub up uh, for a theatre that I saw in one hospital. There, that, those white things are actually operating gloves hanging on the pipe. So you wouldn't want to go in there, I don't think. So you can increase or decrease your stress by your operational considerations. I'm not going to talk about operational considerations, that's Barry. But just considering those things will have a feedback effect on the amount of stress you're under. Remember, it's better to be down here wishing you're up there than up there wishing you're down here. And uh, so always remember to take a long-term view. If it all goes terribly quiet, remember you've got to survive the ditching. And... Uh, pre-planning, expecting that the unexpected might happen is the best help for you. People say, I've got my radio, I've got my, my um, locator beacon, but they're not going to help you in the immediate time. They're for someone to come and rescue you, maybe in 12 hours or something. You've got to survive to them. And ditching can be rapidly fatal <coughs> in the sea, even if a life jacket's uh, worn. And of course, um, if you're in um, desert areas, Equally, the sun and the heat can be rapidly fatal to you. So if you're flying across there, the water temperature down there has got ice floating in it, so it's going to be at least naught, it's going to be around naught degrees probably. So if you happen to ditch into that, you've got to get out of your aeroplane and in, into your dinghy. And if you look at that chart, when the water at the very bottom there is less than zero, you've got under 15 minutes of, of consciousness. And that's for a fit person. And uh, so most of us will probably be unconscious in about seven minutes. And uh, well and truly uh, taking a major last takeoff, as referred to earlier, in about 15 minutes. So um, not long to survive. And even in the waters around here, if you're wearing a, a life jacket and you happen to go in on your way to Rotto and you never told anyone you're doing this midnight flight to Rottnest and the engine coughed halfway across, if the water temperature is 16 to 21, Somewhere between two and seven hours before you're unconscious. So the sun might not even be up um, and you might, might be too late for you. So you've got to, you've got to be aware of these factors. And uh, it all comes down to planning. You can't always escape like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Thank you.